Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of React Roundup. I will be your host today, Paige Niedringhaus, and we are joined by one of our panelists, TJ Van Tol. Hey everyone. And our special guest for today is Catherine Grayson Nams. Catherine, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about why you're famous? <laughs> Absolutely. First off, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I am a senior front end engineer at Threat Connect, and I'm here today to talk about component libraries. That's been kind of my jam recently, a place that I've really enjoyed kind of working, getting to combine some of the skills from my design background with some of the like technical aspects of being a front end engineer. And it's kind of been a, a niche I've found that I've really enjoyed and gotten the chance to give a couple talks on and build a couple libraries at a couple different companies now. And yeah, excited to share. Leveling up is important. I spend at least an hour every day learning ways I can improve my business or take a break and listen to a good book. If you're looking to level up, I recommend you start out with the 12-week year as a system to plan out where you want to end up and how to get the results you want. You can get it free by going to audibletrial.com slash code. That's audibletrial.com slash code. That's, that's actually really interesting. I have used a number of component libraries, Bootstrap, Ant Design, Material UI. Mm -hmm. How do you actually go about building a library, though? That is That seems like a pretty large undertaking. <laughs> it is. And I think it's worth saying first that it's not an undertaking that everyone needs to do. Like you said, there are a lot of really great libraries that really exist. And if you're just getting something off the ground or really trying to iterate quickly, then there's a lot of value in material design or amp design. They're good libraries. <laughs> but it's also true that if you are at a larger company or you have an application that has some different requirements or has a lot of custom components that you find yourself using and reusing that might go beyond your basics, you know, your button, your drop down, then it can be beneficial to have all of those in one place and really get to control the design, control the inputs, the props that are passed in, getting the handle, all the things that are kind of custom to your library. And you'll forgive me, you notice I said inputs, which is because I've swapped recently this new job. We're working in Angular, which I know is probably heresy to say on the React roundup. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so okay. I'm in a weird place okay. now where I'm using all the React terms when I talk about Angular and now using all the Angular terms when I talk about React. <laughs> Messing <But> up both. <laughs> that actually gets me into a question, like how deep, when, like when you say component library, right? Like what specifically are we talking? Because does, does this actually get into like React code? Are we talking about just like CSS and HTML, or does it kind of depend on specifically what you're implementing? At least in my case, I'm definitely talking about code. So okay. uh, creating those kinds of custom components, and it does also include JSX and CSS or whatever your flavor of styling is, <laughs> SAS or less or whatnot. There are definitely component libraries that you can create fully in Figma or your design platform of choice. And those are valuable in that they help you narrow down your design style, your colors and your typefaces, and really getting that kind of cohesive look happening. But when it comes to actually being able to reuse those components that React is just made so well to do, it can help to actually put those all together into one shared library and be able to import them makes building so fast. <laughs> so gotcha. have, have the libraries that you've built are they actually built with React? Because I've there's one in my company that's built with web components because we have teams mm -hmm. who build with Angular, with Vue, with React, and they wanted something that could kind of work with all of them. And it's it's okay, but it's been a little bit painful to implement because it's not actually React code. So is yours like is it specific to a particular framework, the kinds that you've built? Yes. I've done one in React and I'm currently in the process of doing one in Angular. And I agree. If you're in a situation where some of that stuff needs to be shared across, you gain a little, you lose a little. It's about that kind of compromise. But if you are just working in one framework, <laughs> then it's nice to be able to have that specificity and really build things in the way that you know exactly how they'll be used. So I'm wondering if you could help paint me a picture of like what using... A component library like it well first of all is this like if for internal usage or are these things you're like publicly documenting and then then i'm sort of curious like what's the use case like internally like i'm an i'm an employee 
I need to work on a new app. I need a button. Like, what's my experience like? Is it like using like a material or ant design button or is it a little bit different? What do I install? I'm, I'm sort of curious about that sort of stuff. Yep, for sure. To the first part, whether it's something you want to share publicly or not, kind of depends on the company. I know that that's super common now, that idea of like, oh, we'll make it and we'll open source it and then everyone can use our components, which is one of those things that I think honestly is nicer in theory than in practice. <laughs> the idea of <laughs> sharing your wonderful work with everyone and contributing to the design world sounds great, but you actually give yourself just a whole ton of, of upkeep and new variables to consider when you're not just building for your own company in the limited use case that you have probably a stronger understanding of, right? So you then end up in this situation where you're like, well, we know that we're going to use our component this way, but what if someone else wants to use it in some other way? So you broaden things and you end up kind of creating, I think, less specific and useful components because you're catering to a potential audience that you don't really know if you have yet. So I would say if you... If you have a library and you, you want to eventually go back and open source it, and especially if you're working somewhere, you know, real big, you hear about kind of the, you know, the Airbnbs of the world or whatever that share theirs, but not to, not to sound dismissive, but I'm not sure every company needs to share theirs. I think it's a huge accomplishment and a, a great thing in and of itself to build something for your company that suits the needs that you have. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be global, honestly. Yeah, it's actually some interesting points I didn't consider because, I mean, the whole idea behind doing this is you're customizing something more than what you'd find on the general web. So I could totally see conversations of, well, we want to bring our logo into this component, but oh, wait, this is like for the open web. And what if they don't want our logo? Now we have to make this generic. And it seems like you get yourself in the <laughs> more complexity than you cared for concerns that aren't specific to your company right away. Yeah, I will also say at my last company, we didn't share our code publicly. So it was not open source and that other people could use our library, but we had shared it publicly so that you could go look it up online and you could go look at all of our components and like see the styles. And that helped us when working with freelancers and explaining things to clients. We used it a little, in fact, for doing some like quick prototyping and click testing with users, which I'll circle back to because <laughs> I've got a lot to say on that one, but it'll off track us. Um, <laughs> But even then, just knowing that it would be out there on the web, we ran into some things where we were like, well, we're not really sure that we want to make that even visible. Some questions of like IP or like things that were super specific to our app or things that we wanted people to, you know, pay to have access to. We'd be like, well, are we, are we giving too much away? Are we showing too much? You kind of start to, to walk that line. I think in addition to that fear of generalizing your components, we ended up solving it there by basically creating two versions of the library, like a public and a private. So the version that we actually put out that you can type in the URL and see does not include some of the more private and specific components that we wanted in the library for developer use, but didn't want to be on the, on the global stage, basically. Gotcha. It's really interesting. So one thing that you mentioned towards the beginning was when you got to a point of components having very specific functionalities that, you know, generally you couldn't find in like a, an existing library. So can you give some examples of what that kind of functionality might be that you would, that you encountered that you're like, we just, we need to build this ourselves because nobody else really does something like this currently? Yeah, I found a lot of those to be, again, kind of specific to what your company does and what you're building. The last company I worked at was a place called Herman. And they do what's called a thinking assessment, which is kind of similar to a Myers-Briggs, which they'll hate me saying if they hear this, <laughs> but uh, where you kind of take an assessment and then it gives you some information back about your thinking preferences and how you tend to problem solve. So less of a personality thing, more of a thinking thing. But in order to share those results, there's kind of a visual language and even just a, an actual <laughs> technical language that's used. There's a specific set of colors that's used to designate strengths in different areas. Those things were just so specific to what the Herman platform needed to communicate that there's no way it wouldn't make sense for anything like that to be in material design. But at the same way, there were components we were using over and over and over again to show people their strengths, their weaknesses, their dominant, you know, whatnot, the way their profile broke down, their preferred methods of communication the stuff that came up over and over again within the application that we 
needed to to kind of get down and codify in that way for the ease of our developers. Yeah, that totally makes sense when you when you uh, <laughs> describe it a little bit. That's really interesting, though. So when you are or have been working on these libraries, are you building the library and then also building an application that's using it? Or have you been able to like focus specifically on one or the other? Because it seems like those are two full-time jobs by themselves. <laughs> usually it has been more, not usually, both times it has been building both the application and the component library, which I actually think is the right way to do it. You're right that it is a lot, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and I want to be clear that I'm not the only one contributing to these projects on these teams. In both cases, I've been kind of the project lead and I've gotten the opportunity to kind of shape it and come in with that expertise and say, here's how we're going to do it. These are the steps we're going to take. But it would not have been possible without my teammates and the other folks that were equally invested in getting it off the ground and in building components and testing components and filling in that kind of knowledge and expertise that's needed. But kind of circling back, I think it's best to work on both, honestly, because you need to have a feel for how the components are really going to be used and you need to be putting them into use to be able to kind of validate that they are needed. I think there's a lot of times when you start, you kind of think, oh, I need all of these components because, you know, material design has all of these components. Mm -hmm. But you probably don't need every single component that's in material design, but, you know, designed to look like your brand. You can pick and choose things that you'll actually use. You can narrow down use cases rather than like, creating everything and just hoping it'll be used. If you're actually in the application and you're working with the application code all the time, you can get a better feel for what's really needed and what's not needed and what's just going to be filler that you'll have to maintain forever. <laughs> so thinking of the, the components and developing side by side with another app, so are these components that live like in like their own repo sort of thing? And like, is, is each individual app that your company uses, like pulling them in, or do you, is there some other sort of workflow in place? No, that is how it's been set up in both cases, is to have them in their own repo. That does kind of come with its own lift that I know worries a lot of people at first. Because again, when you're starting off, it feels like a huge task to begin with to put together a component library. And then you have to think about, uh, now I have to have this whole other repo, and how am I going to bundle these things? And how am I going to export and import Sometimes the easier mode is to just have a subfolder in your application, especially if you've got like a mono repo thing where all of your applications can kind of share that. That can be a really great place to just kind of get your feet wet and to kind of prove the need for a component library and to get other people invested, which is a huge, 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 huge part of the lift. It's just getting other people to see the value and to get on board with the idea. Yeah, I'm actually wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the corporate politics of this because I have to imagine I think Paige that's probably where you were maybe going with this too because like I think all of us on this call sort of get it right because we're coming from this sort of background but I'm curious if you've had run into problems of trying to get teams like especially in larger companies right you have different teams doing different things like what sort of issues have you run into trying to get everybody to use these components like contribute to them stay consistent and that sort of thing I think the biggest issue is getting everyone on board at first. Because most companies, without kind of realizing it, have started to build a library without thinking about building a library. Almost every almost every application I've poked around in has that shared components folder. <laughs> that is a good start. And it's, it's where you should look. And if you start seeing that get really, <laughs> really busy, then maybe that's a sign that a component library can be a good fit for you. But there's a huge lift in terms of splitting that stuff off. Right, Because once you pull those out into their own repo, you have to make the decisions in terms of what part of this component needs to stay, what of this is really business logic and needs to be in the application versus what's presentational, how is the refactoring process going to work, how are we going to handle just getting everything swapped over. That, that first step, the first step's a doozy. <laughs> but what I try to do to get people on board is to really focus on the outcomes, right? And to kind of be realistic about what that first step is going to be. That 
you don't go in with delusions of grandeur that we're going to have this set up in a week and then it'll be amazing that this is going to take some upfront effort and that every small victory kind of along the way is something that we should celebrate. And in the end, we're aiming for this goal. We're aiming to have X number of components in use in the application and it will help us in these specific ways. And the more you can kind of nail down, we're making a component library because we need visual consistency or we're making a component library to help us coordinate with the design department or to help us do user testing or to help us tackle accessibility issues. Like the more you can set specific goals for your company and use the component library as a path to meet those rather than the component library being the goal in and of itself, the more you'll be able to get people on board with kind of your vision and, and why you're doing it and help them see the value in the the long game. I really like that angle because I think every single company I've ever worked for has had the issue with, oh, look, our header looks different in these eight applications in these <laughs> ways. Or what do you know? We're using seven different fonts or like our, like yes. our button, the, there's no consistency. So I like that sort of as an inroad to making the argument is like it's a, a path to getting there rather than just trying to share things for sharing's sake. Yeah, that's definitely. And in fact, that kind of discrepancy in the UI is one of the first steps I like to take in terms of sitting people down and helping them figure out what components will be valuable to start with. Because again, the best thing you can do is to start to show that value as soon as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you can start to get that that ROI on your library, then the more people will be invested and it kind of snowballs. And that's the effect that you want. I like to encourage people to sit down and run basically a UI audit on their application and to go through and take screenshots of all the different headers and all the different buttons and all the different drop downs. Because when you see all of those in one document next to each other, it's usually enough for people to go, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Maybe we do have a problem. Uh, That's what I was going to ask is how, how would you go about doing a UI audit if you if you're you've never done one before because I have not so I'd be interested to learn like what are the steps for that so credit where credit is due the idea of a UI audit is Brad Frost's okay so I want to throw that out there he's got some really good resources on running one but the way that I like to do it is to basically almost make it like a game set some time aside and kind of make some different categories in like a shared board like a Miro board or you know a Google Slides doc be like, all right, here's the page for headers. Here's the page for buttons. You're going to go on a scavenger hunt in our application and take pictures or screenshots of every single one that you find. And it ends up being, it's kind of a fun thing because you go and everyone's yakking while you do it. And then when you get that and you have everything documented, you have the, the whoa moment, which I think is important <laughs> for everyone to see like, wow, we have 20 of these. And then you can really start to talk through, well, why do we have 20 of these? Is this one serving a different purpose than that one? Does this do something the other one doesn't? Is there a feature that's a part of this? You know, both of these look like drop downs, but one's actually a multi selector in a list, you know, and we need that. And that's a separate component than a drop down. And that helps you kind of isolate what's happening and where it's being used. And if there was any reason behind all those different versions, because a lot of times, you know, we think like, oh, someone was just lazy and coded their own styles. And there's usually like a bit of that. <laughs> but more often, it's people trying to solve different use cases with the skills that they have. So they see a button and they're like, oh, this button is almost the same, but I actually also need it to do something else when it's clicked. So you end up with a button that looks a little different because they took a button, but then they tweaked it because it had to do this other thing. And then you end up with 20 buttons. <laughs> wondering could you talk a little bit about some of the tools you use for making this sort of thing possible as well could, or is this just quite literally you have like my company component library and then like a folder for each component are you using things to sort of help you build this i'm a big big fan of storybook in terms of building out your component library they have a really great system they make it really easy to pick up and start going in terms of organizing your components and seeing that ui preview and getting your documentation all in one place that is definitely i think the way to go if you're going to have a full-on library in its own repo if you're kind of starting off a little bit more basic like we're just going to have this shared folder then i think 
it's okay to also not be swayed by all the bells and whistles of stuff like storybook. Because again, the more important part is to get it out there, get it used. Once you go down, <laughs> once you go down the rabbit hole of looking for things that you can use in your component library, you're going to find a lot of great stuff because there's a lot of great stuff out there in terms of right not just storybook, but all the add-ons that you can add to it, all the ways that you can customize it, whatever you want to use to output or using roll up or using this or what icon set are you using and it's it can escalate so fast and i think a lot of people get mired in that like swamp of too many choices i trademark that the swamp of too many choices <laughs> that's a legitimate <laughs> thing for sure you see if that domain's available <laughs> <laughs> that's what i need <laughs> another, another side project domain to sit <laughs> So Catherine, how do you how do you deal with either requests like people need specific components that your team hasn't built or you have an open source project and people are contributing like how do you manage that part of it and getting people to contribute and then helping manage the contributions to make sure that they, you know, meet the requirements and are going to be useful to more than just one person who built it and stuff like that. I think in terms of getting people in, it can help because I've been doing these in a corporate setting and not in an open source setting. I have had the benefit of less optional participation. (laughs) That's maybe the nice way to say it. If you decide as a team that this is your goal and you have whoever's leading the team on board with your idea, then it's just a project like any other project. They might not be everyone's favorite. I've built features that are not my favorite. And it's just part of your job. I think what's important is to not look at the component library. If you decide to do it, then it's not a side project. It's not an offshoot or a pie in the sky. One day we'll get back around to this thing that you can keep backburnering. It's a project like everything else that you're running right now. It has a different user base, but it's a project all the same. And so I really advocate for building it into your sprints in the same way that you would build any normal project work. Break it down, estimate it, throw it in the sprint, assign it to someone. It's just work. (laughs) The fact that it's internal work shouldn't change that, you know? Yeah, I'm curious. Do you run into struggles where, because I could totally see some project, they need some new component and the quote unquote right way to do it would be to build it into the component library. Mm -hmm. But the faster way to do it, whether it's for deadlines or for whatever reason, is just to like, let's just toss it in there and go with it. Do you... (laughs) find you run into that struggle a lot? Sometimes. And I think it is also okay to just throw it into the app and circle back to it. You just need to document that. And again, that needs to be its own story that comes up in your next sprint and you can't back burner it forever. If it really is like, oh, we have to get this out, build it. You can always come back and pull it out into the library later and refactor. But Usually the idea that you're giving your future self more work is enough to dissuade folks from from doing it that way unless it's a real emergency because who likes to do refactoring <laughs> work? <laughs> Probably some people, not me. <laughs> but I think the better way, the ideal way to handle that is to actually just estimate that story component building work. Sorry, let me try that again. The better way to do that is to just estimate that component work into the larger story. So if you're saying, we need to build this feature and we know this feature will include a component that should realistically be in our library, then building that component, putting it in the library is part of building that feature. And so when you look at it, you don't say like, well, you might have to add a couple of points (laughs) to, to get the component library work accounted for. But the other truth is that once you've got your component library up and going, the overhead of adding new components and putting them into the application is really, really small. You're building it in the same way. You were going to have to build the feature anyway. You're just building it in a different repo and adding an import statement. Better to, I think, knock it out than give yourself work down the road. doesn't save you as much time as you think it would. Hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood, and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there. The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. Oh, boy, I can totally agree with that. There have been (laughs) (laughs) many times when we should have done it in a better way that we didn't, either because the requirements changed further down the road and we didn't know that's what was coming up or 
like you said, because we needed to get it done in, in time of sprint. But that's, that's a great segue. I was wondering how you handle documentation, because that's something that my team has always struggled with, and we're, we're not building a component library. So how do you <laughs> document something beyond Storybook? Because I know it has a lot of great interactivity so that other developers on other teams can use it and understand what the components can do for them. I would actually say that that is, that is a part of Storybook. They've got a whole kind of feature set devoted to writing documentation and showing examples. And it's pretty much up to you how much you take advantage of that. Storybook will automatically generate documentation, but realistically, that's not going to be what you want. It's just going to give you kind of an output. It'll show you the component and the props that are passed in, kind of give you the controls so that you can see like, oh, when I change this, it changes that. But the kind of documentation that you need in addition to that straightforward technical documentation is the design and UX documentation. So you've got three different buttons. How do you know when you're supposed to use this primary one as opposed to the secondary one? How do you know when I need this header as opposed to a subheader or whatever? All of those, those contextual pieces are just as, if not possibly more, <laughs> important than the technical documentation, which is pretty easy to write, honestly. Right? If you're checking your prop types and you're defining things well as you're writing them, then generally the technical documentation is, is minor and it's more the design documentation that's going to take the heavier lift. And it's one of those things that I feel is not fun, <laughs> but it's just part of making the component in the same way that like maybe you don't enjoy writing tests or maybe you don't enjoy you know going back and cleaning up your code after you've got something working but it's just part of good hygiene, I guess, good code hygiene, making sure that you're not just coding to get something done, you're coding for the developer after you. With that in mind, when you, so I, I like the bit you said about the the contextual, the UX sort of background. So do you have, like, do you work with other design, like UX people to sort of create these components? And do, the, do those sorts of roles actually get involved with some of the documentation and such as well in terms of, how these things are going to be used. Yeah, I've kind of been in both situations. In one case, I was the the lone design person on the team. So <laughs> I got a little bit of free reign, maybe for better or for worse, <laughs> in terms of getting able to establish and build those things on my own. In my current position, I'm lucky to be working in a team that has multiple other designers in it. So we get the chance to bounce those ideas back and forth off of each other and really collaborate on making these kinds of components, which is a nice place to be. So yes, I do think that that's part of the documentation, the way it works. Currently, we have a designer who's really focused on putting together a design system, which we're building at the same time as our component library, because, you know, we like to be ambitious, I guess. <laughs> so she'll go through and kind of take a look at the design side of components and say where they should be used and when they should be used, any kind of guidelines in terms of something like the amount of copy that should go into a tooltip or the kinds of options that we should present to a user if we're giving them choices in a pop-up modal or something. Those kinds of design decisions that can be a little harder to make from a technical perspective. So she'll kind of go through and outline those aspects. And she usually just includes them as maybe comments or lines in the Figma file. And then we have a couple of folks who we call UX engineers which are kind of like me, that get to have a foot in each world. And we kind of get to be that bridge and look at those components and say, all right, we'll build it in this way. And because she only wants, you know, a max of this many characters, we can prevent that, you know? <laughs> we can set guidelines and kind of blockers in the way that we build the component that prevent it from being used in a way that it's not intended. You know, we can have inputs get validated and things that prevent you from just blowing through, <laughs> even if you uh, opt not to read the documentation, which hopefully you do. <laughs> documentation is tempting. That's it's usually where I'll go. Well, I shouldn't say that. I go there pretty quickly, but it really <laughs> depends. But that's really cool that you get to kind of be a little bit of both, both the designer side and the actual engineering side. Have you always been in a role where you kind of get to span both or has it kind of progressed since as you've been doing development? I feel very lucky to be in a space where I get to do both actually. 
And it honestly came from the other side. I started off in the design world. That's actually what I went to school for. I have a fine arts degree, (laughs) which, you know, has helped me tons. (laughs) I say sarcastically, but in all sincerity, it really has in that it's given me that eye for color and design and hierarchy and balance and flow and that kind of edge when it comes to working with clients and understanding what a user wants and what someone's looking for and how to kind of give it to them in a way that will be intuitive and satisfying and hopefully enjoyable to use. So I I started off on that end and have actually been slowly making my way into development because as it turns out, it's just more fun. <laughs> I completely agree with you. It is more fun to be building it and and in your case, designing it as well. That's, I think that's such a useful skill to have, honestly. And I wish I had more of a design background because I feel like it would help my own side projects turn out a lot better than they probably currently are. <laughs> I firmly believe that it's a skill that anyone can learn like anything else. I think especially in the arts, we're quick to look at something and say, well, you just have to have the eye or have some kind of innate talent. And I think that's a good starting point. Some people absolutely do, and they'll have that level of native talent just kind of automatically. But the same is true for development. Some people have a really amazing kind of logical mind that can break things down and can see the kind of pathways and relations between these components and can see the way things get passed through functions and how things will return. I don't have that, but it's a skill that I've been able to cultivate just through doing it and hard work and (laughs) messing up a lot. I believe the reverse is is true as well, that if design is something that developers are interested in, then absolutely there are places you can start and skill sets you can learn and it's, it benefits your work at the end of the day. Yeah. I think it's sort of akin to like the, the closest example I can think of is like sports. Like there's Mm -hmm. some people that naturally, and I see this with my kids, right? Certain people just pick up on things faster than others. You throw them a ball, they know what to do a little bit better, but anybody can learn it, right? Like, it's just a matter of, you have to actually put in the time you can't, and I'm guilty of this too. You dismiss it of like, (laughs) oh, I could never draw anything. So I'm not even going to try sort of thing. Like I said, it's totally a sentiment I'm guilty of too, but (laughs) um, it's, it's totally easy to have that gut reaction. It's far harder to actually put in the time and the effort to try to learn a skill yourself. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm in that same camp of like, I'm honestly not a great drawer. <laughs> My uh, pen and paper skills are are lacking. <laughs> <laughs> I suffered through a couple painting and, and similar courses in college so that I can get to the design classes I was interested in. And I don't feel that that and my lack of ability to draw much more than a stick figure <laughs> has actually <laughs> impeded me much. So I, I do have one question to bring it bring it back to the component library a little bit. I'm curious how you handle, say, like more complex components, right? Because I imagine, so you build a button, you build some of these things, like those are something like any web developer can you know, mm-hmm. do pretty decently. But I imagine there's a complexity level where you're probably not going to write it sort of yourself from scratch. Like I'm thinking like date picker, or like you can even go crazier than that, right? You can go into like charts and graphs and grids tables. and that sort of thing. Ta- yeah, tables, exactly. <laughs> so I'm curious if there's a line where like you would say like, okay, this is too complex. And then at that point, would you like wrap some ex- like other library out there and sort of like christen that as like, this is the standard solution we use for this? Or would you just leave that up to like individual apps? I'm curious how you'd handle that sort of scenario. Yeah, I think it really needs to be kind of a breakdown of what, again, what you need that might be different. I think there's no value in reinventing the wheel. You know, D3 is a great library that exists for charting. There's no need to remake D3 in your component library, right? And I also think it's totally fair game to import it into your library and customize the bits that you need and make sure that it's only being used in specific ways that reflect the needs of your application, right? And I think that can even be really helpful rather than just giving someone free reign, like we use this charting library. Here's 20 million charts that you can choose from, 20 million different ways that you can present the same data. A component library can help you narrow that down and say, okay, in this case, we use a bar graph. In this case, we use a pie chart. And it kind of removes that mental lift, I guess. 
which would really be <laughs> tangent. I think that would really be the primary benefit of a component library. If I had to like really sum it up, give you the elevator pitch on why you should make one, it's that it removes so much of that design, like decision-making fatigue that you do over and over in terms of, do I need this? Does it need to look this way? What styles does it need? What's the best solution for this? You can make that decision once and then pull that component over and over and over again and know that it's been thoughtfully created and you, know, you I, can just trust that it's the right choice. <laughs> that's a good point because I it's you, you just tell a bunch of people, yeah, go Google React chart and see what happens, right? You're gonna yeah. <laughs> everybody's gonna come back with wildly different ideas of what to do. And you'll end up with the same situation as the header, right? Everybody's got different ideas for what's best and what we're using and it'll be chaos. Yep. No, there's just as much value. In my last place, we had no real illustrator on the team and no real person whose passion was making icons. So we chose an icon set and we built it into a component library. And we said, this is what we use. If you're building components, if you're using it elsewhere, we use, in that case, Font Awesome, you know, and that, that narrows down that feeling of, I need to go find something or having icons from 20 different sets scattered across the application. Yeah, it's done. You don't have to think about it. <laughs> if taking that approach, do you run into any issues like getting dependencies to match up? Like, so I'm imagining you have like five apps using your component library, right? And you're like, oh, app one needs a new version of font awesome. Then does that sort of imply then the net? So then the other four apps, right? When they go to upgrade, they're going to need to pick up the new version has and I can see that going both ways. That's kind of what I'm curious. Like I could see that being like a forcing function of keeping people up to date on dependencies, but I could also see it being like a blocker, like, oh, we need to update something, but we don't want to have to test the new font awesome version for everything too. So I'm curious what your experience has been with that. Yeah, it can definitely be a little bit of a road blocker. I'm maybe lucky that I haven't quite been in a situation where I have to manage five. I think the most I've done is two or three different applications pulling from the same component library. And it was a real motivator for us to keep everything as up to date as possible. But it did also mean that there were some things that we didn't update in the library because we didn't want to mess things up in the application. And there was a little bit, I think it's honestly just the same way that you judge whether you need the update in the application itself. You look at it and you say, what does it offer? Are there features that are in this release that are really important for us? that make the effort of, you know, jumping up a version or, you know, five or 10 <laughs> worth it. And eventually you get to the point where you need to, and it's important and you make the time and you make it happen. But it's really just a question of, yeah, version management in the same way that you version manage every other dependency, I think in your app, <laughs> it just kind of has that trickle down effect. Like you talked about, you're really, you're really doing version management in two apps. <laughs> yeah. But I think the decision-making progress process in terms of when do I do it? Is it worth it? It's more or less the same. So you've talked about some really interesting stuff that you're doing at work. Is there anything that you're working on on the side that is equally exciting to you? <laughs> I find it equally exciting. <laughs> we'll see if anyone else does. Actually in the process of building a web application called Bubble Up that's intended to help COVID-19 social bubbles coordinate their kind of activities and share information with each other. So the hope is that, you know, in an ideal situation, you say that people in your your bubble or your pod or your quarantine, whatever you're calling it, don't ever interact with people outside of that. But the reality of that is much more complicated in that there will always be exceptions that come up. And rather than pretending they don't happen, I'd love to be able to build those into the planning process as a realistic way for people to still be able to meet up and do so safely and do so honestly and kind of put all of that communication into one hub. So that's my current, <laughs> that's my current work in progress. I'm hoping for an end of year launch on that. So, so is there like beta test going on right now? Or are you looking for help like as an open source type of project? <laughs> it's currently a bit of a one man show. I am definitely open to folks that would, would like to help if they're interested I have a user survey up right now, trying to get a feel for what features are important to people and making sure that we prioritize development in that way. You can find that at bubbleupapp.com. There's also a wait list, a mailing list that you can join. And we'll keep folks informed when we 
are ready to start doing some beta testing, when we're ready to start doing some some just kind of general user click testing, the UX person in me won't launch an app without that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, when we release properly. That's awesome. That's such a, I mean, not only such a good side project to to learn in, but also such a potentially useful one. Are you are you building it with React? I am building it in React. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. major question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm definitely the job I'm in now is in Angular, but I think my my heart will always be with React personally. <laughs> <laughs> I started off in Angular and I am much happier building almost exclusively in React. So I, I feel <laughs> you. <laughs> At the end of the day, they're all just tools in the toolbox, but I think it's also totally fair to have favorites. <laughs> Curious too, do you find like the, the React to me, like, because you built component libraries in both as well, right? Are there any differences mm-hmm. like specific to component building that make you prefer one or the other? Hmm, that's interesting. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think through. React seems a little bit more intrinsically built to kind of handle that component style breakdown. Angular does too, so it's definitely not you know a roadblock. But I think the way in which you kind of learn React and things are, at least the way I was taught to kind of break things down into components and components really modular is a really good fit. I'll also say that a lot because React is a is UI focused and not you know, a full framework the way that Angular is, it can be a little simpler. You kind of have narrowed your focus a little bit. And a lot of the tools that are out there for building component libraries tend to be a little more React focused. I've run into that a little bit with Storybook, which again is great. I've used it for both, but a lot of the documentation, a lot of the examples are, are going to be targeted towards folks coding in React. Gotcha. There's been a little bit of a bumpy road to kind of figure out how exactly that translates. <laughs> well, Catherine, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Is is there anything that we have not talked about that you think that we should? Mm, I don't think so. I'm trying to like, I mean, I pulled up the discussion points and the other thing I was like, was there anything? <laughs> I don't think so. I feel like I could talk about component libraries for hours, but I doubt that's what you want. <laughs> so, No, I think this has really been interesting. That kind of makes me want to, revisit my own team's decision to use ant but oh man we're we're already really committed to it so we probably shouldn't open that can of worms i don't know it's a fun can (laughs) (laughs) so if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about you how where can they find you you can visit my personal website kgrayson.com i am also on twitter perhaps too on twitter (laughs) also at katherine grayson those are probably the best ways. <laughs> awesome. Back when functional programming was making its resurgence, I found it really interesting that a lot of people were moving over there and it almost felt like it was on hype. And I didn't really understand the power of functional programming until I learned Elixir. Elixir is a functional programming language. It's built on the Erlang virtual machine and it really does some interesting things and makes you build apps in a different way. But what's really fascinating about it is the speed of the applications, the ability to distribute work easily, and just how it manages the functional programming and all of the nice things about it so that you don't have to worry about side effects and a lot of the other things that come out of functional programming. Plus, pattern matching in Elixir is a killer feature. If you're looking for a new language that you want to learn that is going to make a difference for you and give you the opportunity to challenge some of your thinking and find a new way of doing it, Elixir is a great way to go. And we have a podcast now on Elixir called Elixir Mix. And you can find that at elixirmix.com. Okay, so now it's time to move into our picks for the show. And this is when we talk about cool websites we've found, things we've been using, TV shows we've been watching, really anything. So TJ, would you like to start us off this week? Sure. So I've been, I've had an app recommended to me called Strava. I don't know if either of you have heard this before, but it's, it's almost like, like almost like a social network for like exercise things like runs and bikes and stuff like that. And I am far from like an elite athlete. Like I get my bike out twice a week. So, and I consider that a victory, but the kind of fun thing I found about it is since it encourages like social stuff, it's a way of me keeping up with people that I don't see in my life anymore, right? It's like coworkers that I'm not seeing. It's just like another way 
And it's outside of like, you know, as discussed, like I'm sometimes too much on Twitter also. And it's kind of fun to just take that out of the equation and just have a fun little thing to see what your friends are up to. So that's my pick. Very cool. That sounds like a great way to stay more active too, which is something I've definitely been struggling with since the pandemic and my gym shut down. And then I didn't feel comfortable going back to the gym (laughs) after that. (laughs) So that's good. My pick today will be a standing desk that I just bought last weekend and am very already very excited about. It's called the Trisante or Trisanti, and it is from Costco, although I believe that you can buy it on Amazon and possibly Wayfair also. But it is an adjustable height desk. It is a powered one. So you just it's got like three different settings that you can preset for you know, however, whatever your preferred height of working is, it's been really, really cool so far. And it's, it was only $300, which is way less expensive than most of the other powered or unpowered desks I've seen. So I am a big fan of it. And I would highly recommend it. It's not too large. It's not too small. It's pretty great. I, I would definitely recommend checking it out. If you have a Costco membership and you need like a real space. Because up until this point, I was working at the dining room table. And after seven months of that, it seemed like it was probably an investment worth my time. (laughs) So that's going to be my pick for today. Catherine, do you have any picks? I know this is a little last minute for you. My pick would be Notion, which is probably a familiar platform for, for some folks. But just in case you're one of the two people that hasn't ever heard of it, as someone who is currently managing my own personal life and building an app and (laughs) building a component library, 20 million other things. I've created Notion databases for all of those. And I feel like I'm pretty much living out of that app now. (laughs) I've got, yeah, one for the app and one for like family recipes that we're all sharing and one for just personal things, to-do lists, my calendar. I feel like if I I didn't have somewhere I could dump my brain, (laughs) I'd lose all of that. And Notion's been just a, a lifesaver in that regard. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the two people that hadn't heard of it. So maybe the other person hey. <laughs> is listening here. I'll, I'll have to check this out because I'm currently, my uh, my life revolves around one single text file that I keep on my laptop, which I mean, works better than you might think, but it, it doesn't scale the greatest. I was <laughs> so. going to say, that just gave me a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> just hearing about <laughs> It's okay. I have sections to it. They're like it's it's not pure chaos. <laughs> Mine's more of the disorganized. I have some notes on my phone. I have some notes on my laptop. I've got a Google Doc. I've got Google Keep. I've I've got stuff everywhere, but no <laughs> centralized system for where anything goes. Really, can I make a second pick actually? Because that prompted us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something I recently picked up is a product called RocketBook. And it's basically a reusable notebook. And you can draw on it. You've got special pens. It actually feels a lot like paper versus some of the ones that feel like dry erase. But the cool part is it's got an app with it. And it comes with like a little QR code in the bottom corner. And it'll scan it and automatically upload to wherever you have set things to go. So mine go to like my Dropbox. It's been really great for wireframing, especially, which I like to do on paper because I don't know evidently 80. <laughs> so I could draw everything out on paper first and then upload it. And then I'll have to sit and, you know, actually make a real wireframe out of it and design software and being able to skip that like awkward scanning or like photo taking with my iPhone phase of it has been super nice. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I'll have to check that out. Cause I'm, I'm kind of the same as you. If I am trying to design something. I just really like to do it on a piece of scratch paper and then yeah. <laughs> I'll end up hauling that around with me everywhere until I've finally gotten it designed. <laughs> I'm sort of fascinated by this. I'm just looking at the pictures and videos of it on the site. It amazes me how far the technology for this has come. Like even like back in our office, back when offices were a thing, <laughs> like we had some stuff like similar not quite like this, but like a, a whiteboard that was, like you said, it's not like technology has come beyond dry erase, which sort of fascinates me. Like there's stuff that actually like comes off and doesn't leave marks till the end of time. So it's kind of cool that I didn't realize you could get this in a book that's like like individual thing you can take around with you. Yeah, I joke that it's like my poor man's 
iPad. <laughs> yeah. I could probably accomplish similar with like an iPad and Apple Pencil, but this was, you know, a couple hundred dollars cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it'd be a lot less distracting as well because the iPad is as bad yeah. as my phone, honestly. <laughs> That's true. And you do get that feeling of drawing on paper instead of drawing on a screen, which, again, I know I sound like very old fashioned, but it does make a difference, <laughs> I think. <laughs> totally. Well, Catherine, thanks again for for having us on. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Thanks very much for inviting me. Had a great time. Alrighty. So we've talked about how to get in touch with you. So I guess we will see everybody on the next episode of React Roundup. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.